For over 300 years, blacks in America have been racially undermined by the government and barred from equal opportunity legally, politically, and economically. History shows blacks were the labor force responsible for the vast fortunes amassed in the United States and Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. However, blacks control only 2% of the wealth in the United States. Good evening and welcome to Detroit Black Journal. I'm your host, Daryl Wood. Coming up on this edition of the journal, we will engage in a revealing interview with Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Labor, White Wealth. In part one of a two-part discussion, we will find out why American public policy, by design, has created a permanent black underclass. That's straight ahead on Detroit Black Journal. Thanks for joining me on this edition of the journal. With me for this edition is Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Labor, White Wealth, and he is also president of the Harvest Institute. Dr. Anderson, thank you for joining us on this edition of the journal. Well, Darrell, thank you for having me here. The Harvest Institute is a black think tank that has as its goal the reforming of American public policy as it relates to blacks. That's correct. What we want to do is get about the business for the first time in the history of this nation, design a policy that is strictly devoted to the economic and social reform of black America by giving them a national plan that would be proactive in resolving some of the major impediments and conflicts and developing broad racial strategies for dealing with white racism in this country. A major thrust in that direction is the release of your new text, Black Labor, White Wealth. That book is incredible in the respect that it destroys myths, long-held fallacies, lies, and illuminates history and factuality as it relates to the black condition in America. And by that, more specifically, the institutionalization of racism is exposed for what it really is in American society. You kick over some sacred cows in this book, don't you? Yes, I do. And that was my primary purpose. Uh, what I wanted to do, Darrell, in writing that book was two things. First of all, I wanted to send out a wake-up call to black America. And secondly, I want to show, I want to prove three things. First of all, is that are blacks in the predicament that we're in? And all, have we been in this, in this predicament for 400 years because what's been told us, first of all, that it was by divine decree or that it was genetically inherited? Or was it really social engineering? And I went back and found out that it's primarily social engineering. That black folk in the, in the predicament they're in because of social engineering. And what we've been what's happened to us all this time, Daryl, <clears throat> is that we've got locked into mm -hmm. a, the lowest status of a no-win monopoly game. That means that we've had wealth in this country redistributed mm -hmm. or maldistributed mm -hmm. based on skin color going from the lightest to the darkest. Lightest, yellow, brown, black. And the wealth has been skewed. So what happens in this country now is you got the white society controlling mm -hmm. almost 100% mm -hmm. of all the income, the wealth, the resources, the business, the corporations, the privileges, and all levels of government. And therein <clears> lies <throat> the problem. That's for your blacks. problem. And the issue is race and resources. And black folk don't have to wear with all the change their conditions. And the reason that they have not historically in America had access is because of the way the, <clears throat> as you point out in the book, the legal system has been stacked against us, the political system has been stacked against us, the access to real <clears throat> property, wealth, money, land, uh, has been prohibited by law. That's the right. Supreme Court has been used as an instrument against us. And it's still being used as an instrument against you. Explain that. Because, because initially, uh, when, when the Constitution was written, all the Constitution did was picked up the old public policy that, was, that had already begun on black folk. When black folk first arrived in this country in 1619, there was approximately 20 blacks. By 1634, the Maryland colony came into existence. That time you had about 40, 45 blacks in the country. Mm -hmm. By 1638, something very profound happened, Daryl, that every black person in this country needs to understand. Something very, very profound. What happened in 1638? The Maryland colony put out its first public edict. 
And what that edict said is that black folks shall never enjoy the fruits of white society. That is very key to what's been happening to you for 400 years. And that is written and established in American that, code. It that's right. Codified as law. In that's America. right. And so, and between that point, let's say about up for about the next 20 years, for instance, uh, the the European colonies were putting pressure on this country, saying, "Hey, we didn't send you to America to have a good time, just enjoy yourself and sit back and relax. We sent you." To relax, we sent you to America to produce some wealth, some resources for our European, you know, continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and most of the colonies were sending letters back saying, "Hey, we can't do anything in this country. We don't have the wherewithal. Uh, it would take us a lifetime to clear the forest, to move the bricks, to get rid of the snakes and rocks. Mm -hmm. And we need a labor force to do it. And at that point in time, the, the the white society knew they had a need. So they, what happened? They brought together a very strong sense of community around that need and said, "We got to find a way of resolving that problem." Mm -hmm. And they looked back at that public edict that was put out in Maryland in 1638, which says black folks should never enjoy the fruits of white society, mm -hmm. and they expanded it. Right. So by 1664, 1665, uh -huh. every colony in the United States enacted a, a slave law that says black folks shall now constitute a subordinated, excluded, uncompensated, non-competitive, managed workforce for the personal confidence and wealth building of white society. And that became your public policy that remained in existence up until recent times. Why isn't that taught in public education now? Why don't we know that? <clears throat> because, because what happened immediately after that, all the institutions jumped in and all the nations in this country jumped in to justify slavery, enslaving the black folk. And so the, the, the religious institutions said, well, we have to base it on something. Mm -hmm. So they said, let's base it on, uh, on, uh, on, on, Bible, on biblical principles, uh -huh. saying the Bible that the blacks were offshoot of Ham, so therefore God had decreed that black folk should be enslaved. Uh, and that stayed in effect for about maybe a couple of hundred years, about a hundred and some years, and all of a sudden they moved over to the biological and said, well, bio blacks are just basically biologically inf inferior. So well, from, from and that, one and that's what the bell curve is telling you about now. And the bell curve, of course, is the controversial book, uh, Assaulting uh, Black Intelligence as Genetically Inferior, that's right. as the author alleges that's right. is the case. That's uh, an extension of the original public policy that was put into place back in the 16th century. As an extension of that public policy, I think the key here is public policy. What you've talked about and outlined in very brief form is how public policy has been designed in this country around the suppression of a singular racial group. That's right. I want to deal with some definitions. Okay. Public policy was used to the extent that black people would be suppressed. Coming forward in time, blacks thought that the great salvation of the race could be summed up in one word, integration. Is that true? Yes. Let me, let me go pick up that public policy and bring you up to that. That public, public policy stayed in effect until, let's say, 1705, for instance. In 1705, it was codified in what we call the slave, uh, the slave codes. Mm -hmm. And the slave code said it, at that time defined how in the future all whites would behave and how blacks would behave. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's why it would call the Southern Ethics, where blacks could not mm -hmm. challenge whites or raise his hand to defend himself against mm -hmm. a white person. And, and in fact, was, white people were told that it was their duty, in fact, to suppress that's right. and uh, severely that's right. handle blacks that's in order right. to enforce the status quo, or they themselves would be considered that's lawbreakers. Right. Right. In other words, they, they violated the code the white code mm -hmm. and see uh, and that time what the, what, the, what the code said is that every white must in fact must must enforce this code mm -hmm. uh, every religious institution must subscribe to it all levels of government must be responsible to it okay mm -hmm. it must be passed on passed on through your social customs but Daryl and also through your laws mm -hmm. I put a lot of those laws in the back of the book right okay and that and once that was codified in 1705 everybody understood the law mm -hmm. then by 1710 for instance uh, Virginia then said now that we have a unified white community, they then broke up the black mm -hmm. community by passing what they call meritorious manumission right. in 1710. And what that says now is to make sure that blacks never have a strong sense of community, a unified self, we will grant meritorious manumission. That's why all these southern states had meritorious manumission laws mm -hmm. to any black who goes against his own people. Mm -hmm. Which in effect said that blacks could be freed that's right. Uh, to enjoy rights and privileges in the society for becoming traitors to their own race. Right, a as a free black. Mm -hmm. But it would never could be comfortable to a white. Right. So when that, when that law was passed, then, then we found that, that, that a black could be rewarded for squealing another black, what we call crabbing. Mm -hmm. And out of a possible 150 so-called insurrections or revolts, mm -hmm. slave revolts, a black person squealed in every one of them. Okay, and he was rewarded for squealing on blacks. That's where you get the crabbing in the black society. Which is society. why there was virtually never a successful black Th that's revolt. That's right. And, but, but see, and, and, and that, kind of, that kind of a system was never used against any other group in this country. Mm -hmm. No other group, Chinese, Hispanics, or, or, or any other group. Well, you make a strong case in the text uh, for the singular 
selection, the purposeful uh, separating out of people of the black race for this kind of treatment, treatment on this continent. To make sure there was never a strong sense of community because a strong sense of community was a threat to the, to the white society. I remember that, that public policy said you should be non-competitive. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the only monument right now in this country that I'm aware of that even recognized and honored a black for being that kind of a black is still, still in existence up in Harpers Ferry. You know where John Brown had his raid that, that night? Sure. If you ever go up there right outside the hotel, mm -hmm. there's a big brown box there. And there's a big monument carved, a carving to the black slave who jumped off the porch the night John Brown's troop, troops entered the, entered the town mm -hmm. and John Brown killed him. The town erected a monument to the Sambo saying this is the kind of black we like. Going from the historical codifying of suppression of blacks uh -huh. to the point where we had a civil rights movement in this country. Uh, the first civil rights movement uh, is not the one that gets talked about very often. In the book, you talk about the first time blacks were freed. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how that freedom was really an illusion. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Why weren't blacks free after they were emancipated <clears throat> following the Civil well, be War? Because first of all, what they gave blacks was three things. First of all, they set him free. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, they gave him a, a supposedly due, 14th Amendment due process mm -hmm. and a right to vote. And, uh, but those things had no, no, no power attached to him. Blacks mm -hmm. could not protect themselves with that. Because, see, everything in the society was based on your ability to be able to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so blacks were set free at that time, naked, penniless, ignorant, defenseless, mm -hmm. without clothing, animals, livestock, land. Mm -hmm. And so they, so, they, so they were abandoned. And you gave him civil rights and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. He couldn't use them. See, first of all, between, let's take the 14th Amendment, which is now the ones we hear a lot about. Between, uh, for the rest of, between 1866 and let's say the 1900s, mm -hmm. that 14th Amendment was used 319 times, okay? Mm -hmm. Out of that 314 times but was by corporations, not blacks. Mm -hmm. Blacks used it about four to five times, and guess what happened? They, they lost. lost every time. Mm -hmm. Blacks never used the 14th Amendment until 1954. But all major corporations use it. That's when you hear about corporations now being an entity, a an person. Entity or a person. They so. used that 14th Amendment that was given to blacks mm -hmm. and gave it to the corporations. And what they did, it, and immediately in, 17, in 16, about 1870, they took blacks' rights from them, mm -hmm. okay? Because they didn't have any power. So once again, the rights were uh, basically suppressed. They were just suppressed. That, that which had been written into law <clears throat> was now effectively thrown, thrown out. Thrown out because blacks couldn't protect themselves. They had mm -hmm. no power. And also what had happened at that point in time is that between 16 and 19, when blacks first came into the country and until the mm -hmm. emancipation, mm -hmm. all the wealth in this country and all the power was built around the black slave himself. That's right. where your money and power came from. Contrary to what people keep talking about, well, you know, land is the most important. Land was never important. Mm -hmm. Land, Daryl, was totally useless without blacks. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, and, uh, President Jackson said that blacks brought 75% of the value to land. Mm -hmm. You can come in this country, an immigrant, go any place you want to find all the land free. Mm -hmm. You can just stake, drive a stake in the ground and say, I own from here to that next street. Nobody cared. It had no value. Mm -hmm. It only had value when you put black slaves on it. Mm -hmm. And that's why all the wealth was concentrated in the South. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, in, in 1860, right. out of, out of, out of, 66% of all the persons in this country had over $100,000 worth. Mm -hmm. We're in the South. Right. As a matter of fact, and uh, uh, <clears throat> out of the 5 million blacks who were enslaved, mm -hmm. they had a net investment value of over $8 billion. That $8 billion was more wealth than all the other corporations and federal government put together. Sure. As a, a white man in the South who had two black slaves was richer than any person in the North. But if you threw, the average person in the North, I threw in his house, his business, his land, his clothes, mm -hmm. his, his net worth, and his bank mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. Well, primarily because it was free labor. It was free labor. It was you, free labor. You worked them until they died. That's right. And, and, and the thing with, thing with the black is you had mm -hmm. to work him unto death, mm -hmm. but you could not let him grow old. Right. Because, because you had no way of taking care of him. Economic liability. That's right. He became a liability. You mm -hmm. had to work him to death early. Seeing then that the policy was set to keep blacks in a place of servitude, cheap, or free labor. Mm hmm. The country set about to make a set of rules, enforce them through institutions, government, the courts, uh, and basically ensure that blacks through the immigration process would not grow to a equal or majority status in the population. Uh, in the book, you outline that we're built in as a, quote, minority, unquote, <coughs> never to exceed a certain statistical level. 
Right. In, in, the, early, in the early part of the 1700s, <clears throat> black, black slaves became such a good thing that everybody was hauling black mm -hmm. slaves into the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Africa, they shipped approximately, from most of the research I can get, somewhere between 35 and 50 million blacks out of Africa. Mm -hmm. Over two-thirds of those died in route and captured. But in this country, uh, the black slave population, let's say, hit its peak about, 17, about the 1750s. Mm -hmm. We had over 34 percent of the, pop, the general population of this country was black at that time. Mm -hmm. That scared this country to death. They found out that the number reached that high. And in the southern states like Mississippi, mm -hmm. Alabama, South Carolina, and Georgia, mm -hmm. the population of blacks had gone somewhere between 55 and 60 percent. And they said, if, and so what the colonies started doing then was start saying to England, and it, remember now, England w was franchising slavery. Mm -hmm. They set up a franchising system for slavery. They were making all the money and the wealth. Most of the wealth of this country was going to England mm -hmm. because the England passed laws saying this country could not own, could not produce anything except cash crops mm -hmm. and send it to England. England would manufacture it, you know, and send it back and sell it back to them. Right. And that's what the Revolution War was over. The Revolution mm -hmm. War was over mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. The wealth that black people were producing in this country mm -hmm. <clears throat> in cotton, textile, rice, indigo, tobacco, mm -hmm. that's, and molasses, syrup, sugar. That was the, that's what the fight was over. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the black population hit somewhere around 34%. And, when, and after the Revolutionary War, they said the first thing we're going to do mm -hmm. is to make sure we get that black population mm -hmm. down because it's a threat to us. So in 1790s, right, right after the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. the first act of the new Congress was to right. pass the enact what we call the first naturalization and, uh, and uh, immigration law, which says this is a white country, white man's country, period. And we set a, a zero quota on blacks in this country. No other group had the kind of quotas or limits in terms of immigration to this country placed on them. <clears throat> The blacks did. That's right, because because they did not want blacks to be a threat. Even and that's why they passed. They also passed um, manumission laws to stop anti manumission laws, mm -hmm. saying that we do not want more than two percent of the blacks in this country to be free slaves at any particular time. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people could not free their slaves, because they were threatened mm -hmm. by the free slaves. Because the worst thing mm -hmm. in, in a white in a white society's mind was an uncontrolled, unmanaged black mm -hmm. person, because it violated the public policy mm -hmm. on blacks. And so they <laughs> so they they stopped a lot of people from freeing the slaves. Mm -hmm. But those immigration laws is, is part of your problem that you have now in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, you, they don't want to raise that immigration. The present population in this country with blacks is 12.3, which is exactly what it is for Africans in the world, 12.3. Mm -hmm. And with the black population of Africa, the world population. But also it's important to know that that's why integration won't work for the same reason. Now, you come forward in time to the question. Mm -hmm. Now, the book spends a lot of time outlining the historical problems right. facing blacks. It spends a lot of time talking about what's wrong for blacks in America, as well as what's wrong with blacks in America. Lest people think that this is strictly a history lesson, let me rush in to say that the book is filled with exposition on solution-oriented plans and strategies for turning this situation around. Uh, it doesn't necessarily call for violent overthrow of no, the no, government no. either. <laughs> no, we don't do uh, that. It is not, and let me, let me ask you this question, it is not an assertion of socialistic or communistic principles, is it? No, no. See, the, pr the primary, the, pr the basis of, of, of the book is saying that black people's future is in their past. You have to understand it. And secondly, uh, from my perspective, see, I, I've never had any incl inclinations towards socialism, nationalism, mm -hmm. any other ism. My mm -hmm. only ism is blackism in this respect, mm -hmm. that I want black folk I see myself as an empowerment pragmatist, mm -hmm. saying how do we get from where we need to go as quickly mm -hmm. as possible to All save right. ourselves from becoming a permanent underclass in this country by the year 2013. And one of the ways that you say will not work is integration. Is integration. Okay, integration well, won't. Black people think that integration is the way to go. And oh, white God. folk have, th have thought forever, liberal white folk mm -hmm. have thought that integration is the way to go. Oh, sure. If I was white too, because I really got you boxed in now. Mm -hmm. See, because, because that public policy, let me go back to that public policy again. At the turn of the century, that public policy was picked up by our organization, NAACP and Urban League. Mm -hmm. They saw, and they said, now we're going to come into existence and try to help black folk. What can we do? They were only permitted to help black folk in the context of the public policy. The mm -hmm. public policy said blacks shall be a managed labor force. Mm -hmm. so, so the precepts of the Urban League and the NAACP was to help black folks find equal employment opportunity. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the mid-1920s, Garvey and somebody said, hey, hold a second, how about some economic? And they said, no, that's out. And so we can never move blacks into starting their own businesses mm -hmm. as, as a national public policy. So in the mid-90s... Because again, the law stipulated that blacks cannot 
no, have but, businesses no, compete with whites they couldn't or compete. do anything that would bring profitability to blacks and take it away from whites. Either through, they, 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 they utilize legal and extra legal means mm -hmm. to keep blacks out. In many cases where blacks, you see, nobody in this country is more qualified, for instance, raising tobacco and raising cotton mm -hmm. to black folk, okay, mm -hmm. and taking care of livestock. In many instances, they would even poison the blacks' livestock. They would burn his, mm -hmm. they would burn his cotton, burn his wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, so blacks could not, and that's why if you look in the back of the book, you see all kind of laws that says blacks should not compete with blacks in all compete with whites in a whole number of things. Mm -hmm. but, by, but by the mid-60s, what happened in the middle of the civil rights movement, there was that, uh, contrary to, to, to what's popularly taught, mm -hmm. uh, black folk didn't get free in the mid-60s. What happened at that point in time was that the uh, that technology finally caught up with that labor need for blacks. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, the public policy said, hey, we don't all, no longer need blacks mm -hmm. to open doors and shine shoes and wash dishes and mop floors. Mm -hmm. We got technology that can do it. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, something very profound happened again for, to the public policy. And what they had to do then was say, the white society said, aha, mm -hmm. now we've got to change this public policy. So what they said is that now that we, that black, we no longer need blacks, what we have to do is go into a new period called benign neglect, okay? Mm -hmm. Or callous indifference, right. or out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. So then they said, so Monaghan came up with a policy by the late 60s saying, or early 70s saying, uh, it's time for us to move from uh, focusing on black folk mm -hmm. to focus on Indians, Hispanics, and women. Mm -hmm. But they also said what we must do in our new public policy is, first of all, make sure that all of our public policies at every level mm -hmm. show no, f express no guilt for what has happened to black folk. Point one is pivotally important. Mm -hmm. Point two is that we show no responsibility or obligation to help blacks in any manner. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which right. means affirmative action or anything else. Point three mm -hmm. is to make sure nothing is done to transfer that wealth that I told you, that 100% wealth on one right. side sheet over to blacks, mm -hmm. that that never occurs. Oh. Right. And so, and so, and that is what we've been locked into from the, from from the mid sixties up to today. But once again, the civil rights movement focused on integration. The right. civil rights movement said, if we can move into their neighborhoods, if we can go to schools with them, if we can sit at the same lunch counters with them, then we'll make the breakthroughs we need to make to end this codified evil right. called racism. Because we had been pursuing since since that original mandate in 1638 excluded us, saying black folks should never enjoy the fruits of white society. That's been locked in our mind to enjoy the fruits of white society. So we want to integrate, mm -hmm. but nobody else in this, in this country ever wanted to integrate. There, what they want to do is assimilate. Mm -hmm. They've always had the option to assimilate by the second generation. The difference being, the difference being that they can move in and blend in. They can intermarry and blend in, and uh, and by the second generation, you can't tell who's who, mm -hmm. uh, or they can have the option of setting up a little little Haiti, a little uh, a little Havana, a little Cuba or a little whatever you want to, or a little Italy. But black folks wanted to integrate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and integrate killed us for a number of reasons. Let me, right. I'll try to get these points in okay. very quickly. One, first of all, integration is nothing but a new modified form of segregation. Mm -hmm. Only thing now, you've broken your people down to a smaller unit, and you defied the first premise of power, which is you don't have, no longer have numerical power. Mm -hmm. Now you're in little small groups all around large urban areas. Mm -hmm. That's point one that's going to knock our brains out. Point two is that the white society maintains what we call a racial balance. Mm -hmm or what we call a tipping point, which says that I will accept black folk in primarily at zero, but I will tolerate them anywhere from up to five to eight percent of any given population. But the minute they cross that five to eight percent population, mm -hmm. it is no longer integration, it's now mm -hmm. invasion, mm -hmm. and I must take action against it. So I'll either take my kids out of school, put my house up for sale, move my business to the suburbs, or I will resign from the organization, mm -hmm. okay? Because I'm not gonna let him get that dominance over me. Third, third thing that immigration do, is done for you, it, it destroyed all your major businesses mm -hmm. because they used the highway system to drive expressways right down the center of every black community mm -hmm. in, this, in this country. And where blacks used to have major business opportunities right. in the country, they were all destroyed. Four, we find that also we got a major capital drain. Mm -hmm. black, there's a basic rule in economics which says you must spend your money in your community and make it bounce five, I mean eight to 12 times before it leaves. Black community, black money never bounced one time. Black folk have approximately three hundred billion dollars passing through our hands annually. Right. That money doesn't even bounce in our communities. There are other things that you mention in the book that are evils to black empowerment. We don't have a lot of time left, but in the closing moments, I just want to throw out some key terms that you express in the book okay. and get your very brief reaction to them. First of all, black empowerment is not the same as empowerment, is it? No. Why? No. Because em empowerment, in my definition, means giving people the, the, the psychological feeling of competence and ability to compete. Now, keep in mind, I told you back on, on that public policy, mm -hmm. they did just the opposite in the conditioning system, was to mm -hmm. tell you that you could never compete with, a white, with the mm -hmm. white society. Right. And that and they, they passed laws that restricted you from competing. And they also, in their, in their conditioning element, they made you see your future and your well-being only through the eyes mm -hmm. of the master, mm -hmm. okay? 
And so when I talk about self-empowerment, I'm talking about how do you get my people to be able to, to feel self-confident, mm -hmm. that, they, that they can pick up resources and be just as competitive as any other group. Group e economics. Group economics. We mm -hmm. have to start practicing group economics, which means you have to start spending your, you've got to quit, you've got to stop the flight of a black capital out of this community, out of our communities. Probably what's happening is black folk are spending 95% of our money in the suburbs, okay? And we leave about 3%, 5% in the community. 3% of that goes to non-black businesses. Blacks are left with 2% of their annual disposable income. It is humanly impossible for you to live off of 2% of your income. So what happens now is that we've enabled a white community to live off of two incomes. They live off of 100% of their income mm -hmm. and 95% of blacks' income. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because both the white community and the black community are boycotting black businesses. That is the primary thing that's killing black businesses. It's not the fact that blacks don't know management, don't know cost analysis, accounting, control, or personnel right. management. It's because both the black and the white community to killing blacks businesses by boycotting them. We also know we don't practice quid pro quo in politics, mm -hmm. which means you got to say to, your, say to your people in an election, what can you do for me whether you're black or white mm -hmm. if I vote for you? Right. And, and presently the system is that since black folk are subordinate to and excluded from the system, mm -hmm. we can only do what's mainstream. Mm -hmm. And if they do what's mainstream, nothing's going to happen for black folk. Blacks must reach a point of self-determination by the year 2015 in your analysis. That's right. Why? Why? Because at that time, about, four, about seven, eight major things are going to wipe us out if we, don't, if we don't do something very quickly by getting some power and wealth, rebuilding our communities and being competitive. One, we anticipate in the next, in the next by the year 2013, approximately 86 million Hispanics entering this country mm -hmm. and 41 million Asians. We have been the number two population in this country now for approximately 400 years. We're going to be pushed from number two down to number four, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you didn't get anything for 400 years when you're number two, you figure what you're going to get when you become number four. You're not going to be in, you're going to have to now speak through two other groups. Secondly, crime is going to be a cold word for blacks. Mm -hmm. Blacks are going to be criminal, further criminalized than they are now. Right. Uh, next thing's going to happen to black folk, we're going to be forced into what we call a new world order. We're going to have to compete with groups all over the world that we're totally ill-equipped to compete with. Um, and, uh, but let, let me get to one other point very quickly. Right. Let me very jump, skip off that second. Very quickly. So, because one of the things I want, I want blacks to also focus on is civil rights. You missed that question about civil rights. Right. We've got to get away from civil rights because that's not the major issue. Civil rights won't give you any power, neither will integration, mm -hmm. because black folk have been so psychologically, right. so politically, and so economically damaged, Daryl, by 400 years of deprivation and exploitation, mm -hmm. that civil rights and integration won't even reach us. Mm -hmm. We can't be reached by it, and we can't be, it, it can do nothing for us. As a matter of fact, even if you're going to talk about civil rights, mm -hmm. then switch it. Right. Instead of talking about, look, gays talk about gay rights, handicaps, right. handicap rights, feminines, females, feminist rights, uh, veterans, veteran rights. Right. And when you get to black folk, why do you talk about civil rights? I don't know any blacks named civil. Talk about right. black rights. Okay. Instead of talking about social integration, talk about economic integration. The book is Black Labor, uh, White Wealth, The Search for Power and Economic Justice. Claude Anderson, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Daryl, for having me. And, of course, you are watching Detroit Black Journal.